Welcome to the top eight of the Clash Bash. Today we have Teppa and Henry. We got two wizards versus actually a very interesting pair, Leviya and mm -hmm. Prism. I'm super excited for this. Alex, you want to take us through uh, what are your thoughts on this matchup? I am I am very interesting. I mean, we it's I, I love the wizard play. I mean, we all know Icelander does super well in commoner, and it turns out she also does really well in Clash too. And uh, I mean, I've always enjoyed a good, fun Kano bashing, but I think this is probably the first time I'm personally seeing uh, Prism Advent of Thrones in Clash in in one of these games. I'm very very excited to see how she performs. I know we have the ability for her to use uh, old Luminaris for her abilities and that's just i mean insanely powerful for her and not not to mention that leviah having the demi hero is a, i mean changes her game plan entirely into this format so i'm very very excited to see all these games and, and kind of see where they take it so so i know this might look weird to people we have two heroes on each side alex you want to take us through why do we see two heroes on yeah, each side? yeah. So the reason we have two heroes on each side, as uh, you know, you might not know, but now you will know that the Clash Bash, uh, we are doing a best of three for our top eights here. We've been doing best of three throughout the format. This is kind of the greatest way for us to get the best of many worlds and really get the, uh, the, the variants that people like to see in metas. And people just like to play their favorite things. And not to mention the fact that young hero formats tend to go fairly quick, as I'm sure we'll see in the videos today. So we like to make it so, you know, it's not just the best of one. OK, you spent your 30 minutes, go home. It's now you get to keep enjoying flesh and blood for a little while longer, too. So absolutely. Yeah. So in this format, you bring two heroes. You have to win both with both heroes. Once you win with mm -hmm. a hero, you can't use that hero for the rest of the match. Yep. Um, so usually what turns out is player one, you know, one player wins with the first one and then whoever loses gets to switch their hero. And then if they win, then we're at one, one, and then you're locked in for that third, mm -hmm. that third game. First game in here, we got Lavaya versus Kano. This is super exciting uh, coming in here. And Alex, what, what's one of the first things that sticks out to you? I know for me, Leviah's equipment suite is is very interesting. Yeah, I I like a lot of you know having to if you were to choose a one handed weapon personally, I probably would have gone either Claw. Even I think even Ballbreaker might not have been a bad choice for Leviah. But the A B suite, you know, they Henry had to have known he was going up against Arcane, and I think you always have to respect Arcane no matter what. So having having Medax come in. Not a bad choice. It does also get you cards into your graveyard, which is kind of important for Leviah's game plan to be able to play these Shadow Brute cards that require you to banish things from your grave. Yeah, and Henry not wanting to give up the hooves, I think, is is a huge deal. I do think, looking at this, when you come in with the hooves, I wonder if you, you know, you. Yeah, I mean, I guess you just always keep it because they do know, right, when they match up, they know like, oh, I'm going against Kano. What's my equipment suite? And I think at this mm -hmm. point, you probably always keep the hooves because you want that plus one. Absolutely. And coming I mean, out. Epod already. My gosh. We, we lo love it. <laughs> it's absolutely nuts. Uh, that is that is absolutely crazy. <laughs> Getting an Epod on there, you want to see it i know early on i faced off against teppa early on in the league and he got out two epots turn one turn zero turn one and when kano gets an epot out like you know you're in trouble they have they, that'll give them the resources they need to do whatever they need in order to set up their deck and as long as everything is on the top in the order they want it to be uh it's pretty easy to get a pretty solid blowout turn but i still think that this early in the game you are going to be saving that E-Pot for a pretty significant turn because with Spell Void and all of this AB, Leviah looks like they're probably going to have a lot of resources in order for them to block out those Aether Flares and any lessons in Lava that Kano might be able to present, but we'll see. We do have an Aether Flare. Aether Flare is absolutely dangerous. You mm -hmm. do want to this is a card you pitch. Bit. You, you pitch, you pitch to this. This is my my theory into Kano's is anything that allows them to opt and anything that allows them to deal damage 
or deal extra damage on their next arcane stuff, you always want to be able to pitch for that. Anything else is just damage to me. 100%. Now, I do think, you know, the more you watch this, uh, the more, and we do have a, a technical error, the more you watch this, the more I... I absolutely immediately go, hey, the mini meat axe is the play because you're pitching so much to mm-hmm. to Kano where you're not actually swinging. Yeah, that is that is kind of the powerful move in regards to Leviah to making sure to get that stuff into the grave because the quicker that stuff gets into banish, you're good to go. So yep. we come back with Leviah with the pulping coming in for six. Uh, we did have that quick blackout. Um, Kano was able to do a couple of AB or a couple of arcane in there. Yeah, it looks like two. Then we're coming in for six here with a dominate voltical bulk blocking. You're getting a go again behind this. So Kano, I mean, you have to wonder, like, do you start pitching here and blast or are you just going to hold down and hunker down? Kano really wants to, especially in clash. Kano wants yeah. to um, do this. We're like, look at now there's nothing. So Kano will wait it out, say, okay, I can block this. I, you know, block what I can. And then I'm going to throw a couple things on your turn. Maybe I'll hold off, do it on my turn, set up something. You're really not flipping, flipping it until towards the end. A lot of times with Kano, at least on clash level, is you're going to play on your turn up until like the last turn or maybe second to last turn. Like you're not doing a lot of flipping on, on that side. So Kano here, you might maybe they'll pitch in and see but i wouldn't be surprised if they just held their hand and then just swung on their turn yep looks absolutely like that. that's what yeah, might that's be the, happening. no no that's the plan they are gonna go ahead and do it all right there you go i mean i guess you know if you're gonna if you know that nothing else is coming on your turn you know playing on your opponent's turn isn't terrible in case you end up getting an emeritus scalding that is kind of a power card in these wizard matchups is because it does more damage on your opponent's mm-hmm. turn so at least giving it a shot is always one thing and getting the aether dart there, not absolutely the best, but trying to get again, that is the whole plan, right? Is just to kind of, while your opponent has no cards in hand, get as much arcane damage as possible off on your opponent and block out the rest of it. Wait until you get down to that, you know, 10 life or so. And then you're going to be able to come in for a pretty powerful turn. There's a spell fire cloak popping. And they're going to see what they get on there. They do have an Ooh, epod. So it's worth just kind of taking a peek and deciding if you want to pop the epod or not. Because that aether mm-hmm. dart right now, that's going to be two. That's going to be two yep. free damage at the moment. Oh! oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, so now Emeritus Scalding. Oh, see, this is this is what I'm talking about. Emeritus Scalding, you pop the epod. There it is. You get to have Emeritus Scalding come in. This is a, an absolute insane amount of damage. I think Emeritus Scalding by far one of the best wizard cards to date because of how important it is to get that on your opponent's turn. That extra damage that it deals is really crucial to chipping down your opponent. And this is going to come in for five because of the crucible. So it comes in for five. Then you're going to ping them with the aether dart. That's six damage that Leviya just said, Hey, I'm going to go in here and, you know, Kano blocked, Six total damage, right? So three damage came in, hit Kano, and then he just turned around and blasted for six to bring it down to parity. Like, that is absolutely insane. And as a Kano player, that's a smart play, and you're just like, I'm okay with this. I still, you know, I still have this at my my fingertips. I'll be fine. Um, you know, and you just got to see, like, is Leviah just going to straight up, you know, come, come at? Now, one of the things of not doing it on your turn Right, is that Levi didn't pitch, so now Levi has a full full grip. However, I think we all know sometimes brute can't use their whole hand no matter what. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of my whole my whole concept with this is usually you're either coming in for one attack or you're lucky enough to get something like a dread screamer to come in for two. Uh looks like in this situation they are gonna break the hooves though to do that two extra attacks. Uh, They really do want to make sure to kind of present as much damage as possible while they still have life. Uh, But Kano's like to go down to, you know, one to two life and then just start blasting. This is another dominate attack. So they are going to leak some damage through if, uh, you know, Kano's going to decide to block. And then they get to come in with something else. But they are utilizing a lot of resources. And it's going to feel bad if Kano ends up having some kind of Aether Flare 
uh, Scalding Turn or Aether Flare Lesson in Lava. It's going to be pretty bad. Now, as a Kano player, do you just take this six? Like, there's not an on hit. It's, I mean, I, I don't usually mind it, especially if you have a whole hand. It looks like they do. Yeah, that's it's not terrible. I mean, th- so there's the Dread Screamer. That is kind of insane. So Dread Screamer now coming in two floating. No cards in graveyard now. So you're usually, you're probably going to get a Meat Axe here. So this is the plan is to Dread Screamer, go again into the Meat Axe, and then Arsenal that card in their hand. This is a very powerful turn. That is, this is already 12 plus three. So 15 damage on a turn with, you know, just a, a hooves of the shadow beast. It's a lot of damage into a wizard, but full grip wizard, you have to just kind of blind almost at this point. You have to hope that you have that stuff. It's kind of a feels bad. They don't have the epon anymore, but to get that emeritus scalding off was a good deal. And they do block with a Blazing Aether, which is a key card towards the end. Mm-hmm. But in this, and we talk about that being a key card and stuff, and in Clash, it is a key card because it is a special oh edition, right? God. But, jeez. That's a wild ride. That's not even, that wasn't even for a Meat Axe. It's coming in for a wild ride for six. They they do get the go again on it, which isn't going to matter too much in this scenario, but it it's that is amazing that is a whopping 18 damage presented and one turn strictly off of the cards that are in the graveyard now kano's just sitting at one it's where they almost don't love to be but at the same time like to be i i I mean i certainly would be that was a pretty power turn but with only three ab now you're able to at least set up it looks like that's their plan is they're going to aether spindle get some get some opt out of the way here and be able to kind of set up their next turn because uh, this is this is the kill turn, right? You know, Kano's got to deal as much damage as this turn specifically because if they don't, then they end up losing. If they don't, if they don't set up their deck correctly, whatever they pitch, this is this is the last turn. If Kano can't win on their opponent's turn during this next turn, it's over. There's a snapback. I was wondering. I was just sitting there being like, why didn't they Crucible of Aether? We at that moment, like, why didn't they crucible? There's a snapback in Arsenal. Was able to come back, get a get some damage in there. So that I mean, that is big. Oh, see, now this is it. This is how this is what happens. the The key moment here is you use everything you have in your hand left over to come in with the kill, a dominated ability. It's it, it, very very powerful. And in this situation, Kano just gets to respond with. I'm going to pitch until I kill you and no cards in hand, no floating resources for Levia. He's got to be able to present seven or more damage. And if he's able to do that, this is game over. Prognosticate is not it, obviously. So you pitch. No. If you have a red, if you have a red, you pitch until you have a red in hand, then you rag a muffins, put the red on top, hopefully get a blue and then you can, and then you can go, but you just kind of wonder what's going on here. Yeah. So I think that's what, I think that's what Kano's trying to do is stack it in a way where they can get their red on top. Because now, when you Kano, you have to pitch another card, and now you can Ragamuffins. And you can Ragamuffins before you Kano. Yep, this is it's important. It's just more of that filtering, getting the stuff you want onto the top of your deck, so that way you can go ahead and properly banish the correct stuff, have the resources for it in hand to be able to power through and deal these really, really nasty arcane damage turns i mean if if the cards are correct if it's even a red emeritus scalding or even an aether flare oh my, <laughs> there it is look at that's that game, that's, man, that's, all, that's all you needed that's all you needed was a red emeritus scalding again another perfect example of how one misstep one overextension of your game plan could very well lead to the downfall of your game and that is it that was absolutely crazy. That was a great game one to start us out, get us all warmed up. Uh, we have Kano down. I do think Kano was probably the the more difficult hero for Teppa to finish. Now we're gonna have a couple of games with with Icelander. Um, you know, at least at least one more. Uh, but Icelander isn't the queen that she always is or has been traditionally in Clash. You know, with some of the bands that they've hit with her. So we'll definitely see it. But that was an absolute masterclass with Kano on how you can utilize Kano in Clash. Because I think a lot of people kind of write off Kano and say, Kano's no good in Clash. 
uh, right there. <laughs> you kind of show the power. Tepa, I think has Tepa, I think has perfected that deck list. I agree. I agree. I think it's it's an absolutely insane list, and it's it's you know it doesn't matter what format you're in, whether it be commoner, blitz, clash, classic constructed. If you don't respect arcane damage, you will get the pain that it brings. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope you'll come join us again as we continue down the best of three. Alex, where can I find you? Well, uh, you can go ahead and find me over at Ashen Wings TCG over on YouTube. You know, we like to also post some Clash gameplay and commoner stuff over there, too. So if you guys like the more lower end formats, by all means, feel free to find me on there. You can also find me on Twitter at Ashen Wings. That's where I like to kind of just talk about the new stuff that happens in Flesh and Blood and just like to connect with the community. Absolutely. And I'm Nathaniel. You can find me here if you're watching it. This is where I live. I'm the guy behind the, the camera editing. So if it's crappy, you know, just message me and tell me how terrible it is. Uh, we'll try to fix it. Uh, but we appreciate everyone joining us here. Mm-hmm.